Hi, and welcome to Washoe County Library's Women's Suffrage Centennial Discussion. Uh, we are going to have a talk today, and the speaker today is Carolyn Runnels, and she is a certified interpretive guide from the National Association for Interpretation, which focuses on interpretation as a science and the art and culture and history of the subject. She combines her love of history and her love of historical clothing as a vehicle to bring history to life. So I hope you enjoy the talk today and I'm gonna turn it over to Carolyn in just a minute and enjoy our talk and we'll have questions at the end, okay? Thank you. Thank you, Sarah. Pam, I appreciate it. And I'm delighted to be here. Go ahead and start the screen share and we'll just go ahead and get right into it. So put the glasses on. Delighted to be here, and uh, it's always a joy to present this. So there is a difference between a suffragist and a suffragette, and they use different tactics for women to achieve the right to vote in August of 1920. And we're going to look at the timeline of the suffrage movement, a few key leaders, a few references to the British movement, and how color and fashion influenced the women who took up the banner to fight for the right to vote. I'm gonna be covering this pretty fast. The top is at least a semester course, and so we'll be hitting the highlights. So often when you see this type of picture and think, this is the typical look of a suffragette, the white suit and the tricolored sash. This look has become synonymous with the attire that was worn to win the vote. That today we copied this type of dress such as here. This is the Rose Bowl Parade in 2020, and it has ladies representing every state. You know, Picasso said we need to learn the rules like a pro so you can break them like an artist. And I think we do a huge disservice to all the ladies of the early 1900s if we think that everyone wore this type of ensemble that you see here in this picture. Uh, so I, I think it's prudent for us to learn as individuals to be aware of what symbols stand for. And after today, you may or may not wear this ensemble and sash, but another type of dress and a sash of a different color. And by the way, the color of these slides is a hint to what was the dominant colors of the suffrage movement. I did include a little bit of England in this timeline because several of our leaders here in the US actually helped the women of Britain. There was a lot of travel across the pond, both ways, uh, for the support of suffrage. And sometimes the colors that we see today depicting the suffrage movement is actually British and not the US. So let's look at a couple of definitions first. Suffrage comes from the Latin suffragium, which means the vote or political support, and, suff and universal suffrage means everyone gets the right to vote. But what is a suffragist? Most, well, a suffragist is believed in peaceful constitutional campaigns. She campaigned through meetings, uh, such as meetings and leaflets and petitions. And a suffragette was a woman who advocated suffrage for women, but they were a new generation of activists. They were willing to take a direct militant action for the cause. So the term suffragette actually was coined in 1906. It was coined by a British journalist, Charles E. Han of the Daily Mail. And he toined, coined the term suffragette to actually mock and diminish the women of the movement who sought to vote through violent or militant means, such as arson, hunger strikes, or destruction of public property. So he added the little diminutive suffix X, and it was seen as derogatory term, meaning to minimize the women and distinguish them from the constitutional suffrage act advocates. But let me tell you what England did with the term suffragette. Members of the WSPU, the Women's Social and Political Union, the radical branch of the British suffrage movement, embraced Charles Hand's intended insult and called themselves the suffragettes with a hard G 
to signify that they were going to get the right to vote. And in 1914, the WSPU, the Social and Political Union, appropriated the meaning term as the title of their newspaper, The Suffragette. Also, here in the, U in the US and the UK, newspapers used the term suffragette when referencing the more militant movement and then it started distinguishing between suffragists and suffragettes. They portrayed the suffragists as a gentle and innocent woman, but vulnerable to joining their more aggressive counterparts. Most historians will start the suffrage timeline in the US in 1848, but women's roles in politics start in 1776, or let's say they don't start. So in March of 1776, while John Adams was in Philadelphia with the other founding fathers to decide the best way to declare independence from England, Abigail wrote her husband John and said, remember the ladies and be more generous and favorable to them than your ancestors. Do not put such unlimited power in the hands of husbands. Remember all men would be tyrants if they could. If particular care and attention is not paid to the ladies, we are determined to form a rebellion and will not hold ourselves bound by any laws in which we have no voice or representation. If those founding fathers would have listened to Abigail, we'd be a lot further down the road, I think. But in 1877, women lose the right to vote in New York. In 80, they leave, lose the right to vote in Massachusetts. In 84, they lose that right in New Hampshire. And in 1787, the U.S. Constitutional Convention places the voting qualifications in the hands of the states. And women in all the states except New Jersey lose the right to vote. This is the original 13 states, the 13 colonies, and then became states. So in 1790, New Jersey grants the vote to all free inhabitants, which included women, which included women. And then in 1807, women lose the right to vote in New Jersey, the last state to revoke that right. So we're going to start back in the 1800s and when here's when the big push starts for suffrage. Well, in 1840, Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton are barred from attending the World Anti-Slavery Convention, which was held in London. And they were barred because they were women. And this prompts them to hold a women's convention in the US. So in 1848, the first women's rights convention is held in Seneca Falls, New York. Elizabeth Cady Stanton writes the Declaration of Sentiments. It is a set of 12 resolutions calling for equal treatment of women and men under the law and voting rights for women. But it's not just about voting rights, it's about rights within the marriage, property rights, child custody rights. It goes beyond uh, women having the right to vote, but it does set the stage for other women to publicly campaign for voting rights. After two days of discussion and debate, 68 women and 32 men signed the Declaration of Sentiments. Amelia Bloomer, I want to mention her because in 1849, she created The Lily, a newspaper dedicated solely to women. At first, it addressed the temperance movement. However, due to demand, the bi-weekly paper expanded to cover other news. After meeting the activist Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Bloomer started to pu uh, publish articles about the women's rights movement. But Bloomer's most influential work was in dress reform. After seeing another woman, woman wearing the Turkish trousers and noticing the health hazards and respect, restrictive nature of courses and dresses, Bloomer pushed for women to adopt the new style of dress of dress reform in her newspaper, The Lily. The trousers or pantaloons are now called bloomers. They not only illustrated a departure from the accepted dress for women, but attracted much ridicule from conservative men and women. But one of Bloomer's biggest things that she did that is notable is that she introduced Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony to each other. And this meeting set in motion a long, long-standing partnership between the two activists 
who were prominent leaders of the suffrage movement. Now, let's jump back to England real quick and let's see when they started their suffrage. It started in 1832, Henry Hunt presented the first petition from an individual woman asking for the vote. The petition was from Mary Smith, who stated that she paid taxes, was subject to the rule of law, and therefore did not see why she couldn't vote. Of course, that petition did not pass. In 1850, a thousand women attend the National Women's Rights Convention. This was a convention that ended up being held yearly for several years. And there were also other states that held National Women's Rights Convention after this first one, but all of them formed a strong reliance with the abolitionist movement. So from 1851 to 1861, women continued to push for women's rights led by Stanton and Anthony. So from 1861 to 1865, of course, is the Civil War and efforts for the suffrage movement come to a halt. Women put their energies toward the war effort. But after the war in 1866, the American Equal Rights Association working for suffrage for both women and Americans is formed at the initiative of Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. So this was the first organized group, the AERA. And if any of you have been following the news feeds and social media regarding the rights of the black women, this is where it starts to fall apart for them with suffrage because their first test came in 1867. The ERA was in Kansas, a Republican state and they had voted down two separate referendums granting suffrage to blacks and women's respectively. During the Kansas campaign, organizational founders, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony had accepted the help of a known racist alienating the abolitionist members as well as the AERA president at the time, Lucretia Mott. So they split in 1869. And Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony found the National Women's Suffrage Association to achieve the right to vote through a constitutional amendment. In other words, they're gonna work on the federal level. And Lucy Stone and Lucretia Mott and other conservative activists form the American Women's Suffrage Association to work for women's suffrage through amending the state's constitutions. So you got two groups working now in the United States. Well, Congress had passed three amendments after the Civil War and the 15th Amendment was in, uh, prohibits the federal government or the state from denying citizens the right to vote based on race, color, or previous condition of servitude. Although the 15th Amendment does not specifically prohibit women from voting, it does not guarantee them the right either. Approx uh, so in 1872, Susan B. Anthony cast her first vote in an attempt to uh, see if she could get the right to vote for women. She was arrested and found guilty of unlawful voting. And in 1869 to 1906, Elizabeth, I mean, Anthony continues to appear before every con uh, Congress until her death in 1906 to ask for a passage of an amendment to the US Constitution, asking for voting rights for women every year she's before Congress. In 1878, Anthony and Stanton arranged for Congress to be presented with an amendment giving the right women the right to vote. It was introduced by Senator Aaron Sargent. It later became known as the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, and this was in 1878. So for the black women, in the communities, they were working for decades, largely separated from white suffragists, but keeping their eyes on the same prize. 
Over time, black women's clubs and Baptist churches became major centers for the suffrage throughout the country. Now, what's interesting is that following emancipation after the Civil War, blacks and theor were theoretically equal before the law, including women in the 1920 uh, when we won the right to vote. We, they had the suffrage also, they could also vote. However, in reality, most black men and women were effectively barred from voting from about 1870 on until the passage of the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So people of color, even though they technically had the right, were actually barred from voting. So you remember that split that happened back in 1869 uh, from the e AERA? Well, in 1890, after several years of negotiation, the National Women's Suffrage Association merged and the women and the American Women's Suffrage Association, those two that had split from the AERA, merged to form the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the NAWSA. There are so many acronyms as you go through this uh, time period for women, but this group was under the le leadership of Elizabeth Cady Stanton. Now, this is the women's main organization, the NAWSA, and will be until 1920. But their goal focuses on state by state campaigns to win the voting rights for women. At the time that they formed, there was 7,000 members in this group. Eventually, it increased to 2 million, making it the largest voluntary organization in the nation. Meanwhile, back in England in 1870, uh, 1897, 20 national societies, there were several splinter groups formed together to make the NUWSS. But in 1903, Emmeline Pankhurst, a member of the Manchester suffragist of the, uh, the NUWSS that was formed just a few years earlier in 1897, was frustrated with the wait and see tactics. And she forms the Women's Social and Political Union, the WSPU in 1903 with her daughters, Cristobal and Sylvia. And early on, the WSPU begins a militant campaign such as bomb and arson campaigns, smashing windows, chaining themselves to railings of public buildings. They are arrested, which starts the hunger strikes and the forced feedings that you read about. And with all the travel back and forth across the pond, some of our women were also involved in that uh, with the WSPU. But what are we doing here in the US from 1890 to 1900 to further the cause? Well, since that merger, the NAWSA in 1890 organizational leaders for the last 10 years have been visiting state, each state and local communities to help set up, whoa, help set up uh, suffrage offices focusing on the local levels and within the local communities. These suffragists, this is just a few of them here, continue to crisscross the country despite the difficulties and personal dangers to put their cause directly to the people. They were the ones in the news, the leaders as they spoke on college campuses, social clubs, state legislations, and churches. The suffragists waged 14 state campaigns between 1867 and 1900, but they only won two, Colorado and Idaho. The two Western territories had already approved women's suffrage was Wyoming and Utah, and they became equal suffrage states in the 1890s. These four states, symbolized by the four stars that you see here on this poster, were the only places women could vote equally with men until 1910, Wyoming being the earliest at 1869, and only four states out of the whole nation till 1910 did women have equal suffrage. So as we move into the 1900s, the 
it, the face of the suffrage movement starts to change because we, the women and several smaller suffrage organizations in each state and community, along with the National American Women's Suffrage Association, becomes more visible as a whole, as a group. It's a group of women now, not just the leaders making in a statement. And this, the 1900 starts this with parades and marches and rallies. And it happens, like I said, all over the nation. But New York is a good example of some of the things that happened. In 1908, 23 members of the Progressive Women's Suffrage Union, now this is a union, they got together and they marched down Broadway illegally, 23 members. Two years later, 400 women of the Equality League of Self-Supporting Women, another workers union, marched along Fifth Avenue. Well, in 1911, the next year, they decided to do another parade since the 1910 was pretty successful with 400 women. And uh, it becomes an annual event with the new route down Fifth Avenue. And this year in 1911, there's 3,000 that march with floats and bands for the first time that are included. And then by 1912, 15 to 20,000 ladies march. And this kind of thing was happening all over the country. And besides parades, rallies, and the handing out of literature, suffragists were looking for ways to make an impact on the public in a, now this is your key words, orderly, organized way. New York leader Harriet Stanton Blanche, who was Elizabeth Cady Stanton's daughter, she also decides there are other ways to gain support for suffrage. She realized that, and this is a quote from her, we have learned over and over again as we toiled in our campaigning, sermons and logic never convince that human beings move or make decisions because they feel and not because they think. For that reason, they begin to dance about their cause at great balls. And in 1913, Votes for Women Ball attracted over 8,000 people. In 1913, the first major national efforts were undertaken beginning with a massive parade in Washington, D.C. on March 3rd. The parade was one day before the inauguration of President Woodrow Wilson. The program was 20 pages long. That's it right there on the right-hand side. Um, and it was organized by Alice Paul that you see there on the left with the blessing of the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the large group that had several thousand members. The parade was calling for a constitutional member, amendment featured 8,000 marchers, including nine bands, four mounted brigades, and 20 floats. The organizers used an intricate color scheme to create an impression of harmony and order. Marchers were divided by profession countries and states, and each group adopted a, a distinct color, such as social workers wore blue, educators and students wore green, writers wore white and purple, and artists wore a pale rose. Though the, ra though the parade began late, it appeared to be off to a good start until the route along Pennsylvania Avenue became cloaked with tens of thousands of spectators mostly men in town for the inauguration. Marchers were jostled and ridiculed by many in the crowd. Some were tripped, others assaulted. Policemen appeared to be indifferent to the struggling paraders or sympathetic to the mob. Before the day was out, 100 marchers had been hospitalized. The mistreatment of the marchers amplified the suffrage event and the cause unto a major news story and led to congressional hearings, where in DC, the superintendent of police lost his job. Well, their cause made it before Congress in 1913, but not to pass a referendum for voting rights that's gonna still take another seven years. There are two ladies that you will hear about who helped the suffrage movement here in the US, and that's Alice Paul, that's on the left, that organized that big parade, and Lucy Burns. Both ladies were highly educated, intelligent women. 
Alice Paul and Lucy Burns had spent time in England with the WSPU, the radical branch of uh, the English suffragettes. Both gals had been part of the militant proceedings in England. Both had been arrested. Both had been force fed in prison. And both women were passionate about activism and the feminist struggle for equality in the UK. Inspired by the WSPU, Burns and Paul continued the fight in the United States. Right after that parade in Washington, DC, both girls form the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage, and then it later became known in 1916 as the National Women's Party. They borrowed strategies from the radical uh, WSPU in England, and members picketed the White House and practiced other forms of civil disobedience. Not to the extent of England, but slightly. There were a few force feedings and prisons, uh, imprisonments here, but not to what England did with the WSPU in England. And remember that these ladies had been associated with the NAWSA, but their insistence, Paul's and Burns' insistence, that women's suffrage work should be concentrated on the federal level rather than the state and local, such as the NAWSA was doing, and because of their civil disobedience, they disassociated them from the larger NAWSA. They sort of parted ways. But the larger group still continued to work on the state's rights. So meanwhile, though, back in England, violence continues with suffragettes trying to force their way into Buckingham Palace to petition the king, and the First World War begins. Suffrage prisoners are set free, and campaigning stops, and ladies are urged to join the war effort. So here in the United States from 1915 to 1919, suffragists from 12 Western states, you see the white states on the left, up to all those states uh, had suffrage and supported voting rights for the women, except for the Eastern counterpart. And by 1915, uh, by 1919, these women could vote equally in those first 15 states. And you see the ladies on the right. These ladies are calling for their Western sisters to come please and help them. Now, every time I look at this slide, I'm a product of uh, the 21st century, I think, because I see zombies calling the, our sisters from out west to come help us out in the east. So meanwhile, back in England, the Electoral Reform Bill passes the Commons for women to vote. Yes, they've got it. They get to vote if you are over the age of 30, or you're 21 and own your own house, or you're married to a householder. This is definitely not equal and not universal. So in 1918, another bill is passed allowing men over 21 and women over 30. It's still not equal. It's still not universal suffrage. So here in the United States in 1918, President Woodrow Wilson states his support for a federal uh, women's suffrage amendment originally written by Susan B. Anthony and introduced to Congress in 1878 is passed by the House of Representatives and the uh, Senate. It is then sent to the states for ratification. Now, this is the same bill, no wording was changed, and it took it from 1878 to 1919 to finally get uh, before the Senate and sent to the states for ratification. And so now throughout the rest of uh, 1919, the National Women's Party and the National American Women's Suffrage Association, the two groups here in the US, began to campaign to obtain ratification of the 19th Amendment by 36 state legislatures. That was the required three-fourths majority at that time in 1919 for ratification of an amendment. The ladies in England gained the right to vote in 1928. So fashion and color. It helped to mold the cause. And what is, you know, that iconic look that says you are a suffragist or a suffragette, we think is that white suit and the tricolored sash. 
Well, before 1906, you're going to be known as a suffragist or a follower of the suffrage movement. And it did not matter if you were male or female, you were a suffragist, you were, uh, you were in favor of universal suffrage. And it starts back in 1848 with Stanton's Declaration of Sentiments and that 1850 Women's Rights Convention that continued yearly. So what were women wearing that would set them apart from society that said that they were fighting for women's rights? Well, this is the fashions of the 1848s and 50s, and there's really no recognizable dress or color to set you apart from the rest of society. There is only one ensemble that set you apart from the mainstream, and that was Amelia Bloomer's dress reform. And yes, Amelia Bloomer, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, her daughter, Susan B. Anthony, and other leaders wore the dress reform. Lucy Stone loved the dress reform and continued to wear it long past when the others had given it up. In a letter, she, I can't remember if it was Stanton or Anthony, she stated that she would have to stop wearing the dress reform so the press would listen to where she, what she had to say and not to what she was wearing. But the use of color begins, and this is the fashion of 1867. And remember when uh, Stanton and Anthony went to Kansas to campaign for the state suffrage referendum? Well, the suffragists there in that state used the color gold or yellow derived from the color of their sunflower. The sunflower was the state's uh, state flower, uh, Kansas's state flower. And they used gold pins, ribbon sashes, yellow roses to symbolize their cause. This ribbon or pin or suffrage badge from that campa campaign, it's about three and a half by nine inches, is the very first symbol that we find that is a votes for women that women were using as a group to set themselves apart and to be recognized as suffragists. So you will see in pictures that continue on throughout, uh, such as this one uh, up to the 1900s, this like this one that is of the suffrage movement. This is a group of ladies uh, from 1880. They are state activists at a national meeting, meeting of the NAWSA. But what I want you to notice about this is that the women have on pins and ribbons uh, throughout this. And this is probably uh, the suffrage yellow that they have on. And it's known uh, as the color of the sunflower. Kenneth Florey, has a website on memorabilia and has written a book, Women's Suffrage Memorabilia, it says from 1867 to 1920, there is much documentation of women wearing the suffrage yellow. And the next slide, there are even ribbons from state and national conventions for the delegates that are all that suffrage yellow. Just, this is a few here, here's a few more. As you can see, the suffrage yellow was used throughout the years by states and the national organization, the NAWSA. So this was the main color that pulled the, the uh, suffrage movement together and identified you as a suffragist. Basically, whatever you chose to wear from 1867 to 1920, and this is uh, silhouettes of fashion at that time, if you put a badge or a pin or a ribbon in suffrage yellow on, you would be historically correct. Even up to 1920, such as this poster right here with a sash in suffrage yellow. There are some incidences where a parade or a rally was held and the organizers stated what the participant should wear, such as this quote parade in St. Louis. This is known as the 1916 Golden Lane, Missouri Golden Lane. More than 7,000 women dressed in white and holding yellow parasols with golden sashes bearing the words votes for women. They stood silently lining 12 blocks of Locust Street. The ladies in white represented the states who had, did not have suffrage, the leaders in gray for the states that had partial suffrage, and the leaders in black for the states that had full suffrage. This was a walkless, talkless demonstration in St. Louis on June the 14th, 1916, opening day of the Democratic National Convention at the Old Coliseum in St. Louis. 
The delegates, almost all of them men, stayed in hotels downtown and walked a road to the 10,000 seat convention hall. Suffrage leaders had insisted that the women not say a word. It was a silent protest. The men passing by chipped their hats and the parade was a huge success. And this is a flyer calling for the women and telling them that what they'll be wearing. And on the right is actually one of the sashes from that parade. But what about the tricolors that you see on suffragettes, or especially the sashes and buttons and jewelry, like the green, white, and purple, or the white, gold, and purple sashes? For that, let's go back to England. The head of the WSPU, Emmeline Plankhurst, and her daughter Sylvia was their official artist. She was a painter and designer of high quality and her imaginative artwork was invaluable to the WSPU. In 1908, the WSPU adopted the color scheme of purple, white, and green. That would not only distinguish them in their political movement, but would also prove to be a huge marketing success. The editor of the Votes for Women, the WSPU's weekly newspaper, explained the colors. Purple, as everyone knows, is the royal color. It stands for the royal blood that flows in the veins of every suffragette. White stands for purity and private and public life and green is the color of an emblem and hope of spring. And Sylvia designed banners, flags, gifts, memorabilia. You see some of it right here and you actually see their sash, their tricolor sash down in the bottom left. This was a very successful early triumph for fashion branding. But did the US have a tricolor? Yes, we did. And it came out in 19, uh, 13. The group that came out with the three colors was the Congressional Union for Women's Suffrage in 1913. They later became known as the National Women's Party in 1916. This is Alice Paul and Lucy's Burns group. Remember, these scouts have been over in England with the WSPU. They copied after England. The suffragists, their newspaper, published on December the 6th, 1913, describes the symbolism of the colors. And theirs was purple, white, and gold. And purple is the color of loyalty, consistent to purpose, unswerving, and steadfastness to cause. White, the emblem of purity, symbolizes the quality of our purpose. And gold, the color of light and life. It is the torch that guides our purpose, pure and unswerving. Simplified, the tricolor signified loyalty, purity, and life. This is a sash from the NWP's archives. Now, what I want to point out about this, there is no writing down through the center. It is always left blank. And they have hundreds of these sashes in their archives, and they're all like this. They're the white, uh, purple, and gold with no writing down through the center. And this is 1913. So were these colors used in parades? Yes, they were. Now remember the 1916, which is three years after this tricolor came out, the group in St. Louis used the suffrage yellow. But this group here in 1916, three years after the NWP was founded, uh, there was this event. And I'm not sure if it was an NWP sanctioned group or not, but they did use their colors. Yellow, purple, and gold was the predominant color in the scheme today in the suffrage uh, uh, parade, as you read through this little uh, excerpt out of the newspaper. What's interesting, though, is that this uh, biographer and a historian on women's suffrage, the largest group, the NAWSA, had no official colors. But yellow and gold was the most commonly used and later once were, parades were utilized white, as we saw in that 1916 parade, three years after they came out with the tricolors in 1913 here in the US. The tricolor used was exclusively in this country by the Congress, Congressional Union National Women's Party, Lucy Burns and Alice Paul's group. White and gold are the only two colors which were historically employed by the whole of the suffrage movement, militant and mainstream. 
So it seems pretty clear that suffrage yellow was used by other groups. This is groups on a municipal, state, and federal level for support of suffrage, and the tricolor was associated with the NWP. But along with clothing, suffragists used these accessories. They had banners and flags and cookbooks and pins and buttons and songbooks and flyers and brochures and umbrellas and bags and, of course, sashes. These are some sashes of the time periods, and the suffrage yellow sash may or may not have had writing in the center of it. And it didn't have to be a sash as we think of a sash. Look at the ones that are the pennants. You will see them with women wearing the pennant draped across their chest. Um, and these other groups, the ones like the one in the top left, is a one from Harriet uh, Blanche's union group. And the bottom right one is from Carrie Chapman's uh, union group. So sashes came in a variety of color and style, depending upon what group you were with. And this 1912 photo that we saw earlier, our, our, our brains, when we see this, we think what? Because there was no color photograph, we think this is white, like the typical suffragette or suffragist would have been wearing. This has been colorized, and this might be more of an accurate rendition of what some of the colors the women were wearing. Yes, there seems to be some white, this artist thought, but there seems to be some pale blues and grays. I am going to take issue to, with one thing here. You see those pennants that are draped across their chest? Those would be, this is 1912. The tricolor did not come out until 1913. So what color would those sashes be? They are probably the suffrage yellow that we uh, saw that Her uh, uh, Flory talks about in his book. Unless we can find documentation of what the organizers wanted the participants to wear, it might open up the mind the possibilities of what might have really been worn by suffragists or suffragettes. And here is one. I just threw this one in. I just thought this one was interesting because banners and flags run the gamut from really elaborate fringed uh, material to what this very stylish lady is carrying. And her name is Mrs. Suffren. It's a dowel with a cardboard that is tied on with rags and it's dated 1914. And you can see her sash and this is definitely not the tricolor, so it's probably the suffrage yellow, given its color. Uh, I actually have some examples back here that I made up uh, and ones that I had bought. And here's another picture. We don't know. It's, it's the, definitely not that iconical look that we think of, of the white dress, but these are suffragists or suffragettes handing out, uh, um, it looks like door-to-door uh, -door campaigning, they're handing out some kind of literature. And then when I, but it's definitely not white. When I saw this picture on the left, I thought, holy smokes, it's the suffragettes from Northern California, Nevada, don't tread on me flag. It's the Gadsden flag and the suffragettes, you'll find this throughout. And the suffragettes use this quite often uh, to try and gain freedom. This flag was first used in 1776 by Colonel Gadsden. And if you didn't have a pole or a banner, feel free to wear your uh, banner as an apron, as these ladies did in uh, England. I love this picture. Look how they're smiling and laughing and having a good time. This picture is in March of 1913. Very stylish ladies uh, and ensembles. I, boy, I wish I had some of these today. And notice the cockades that they have on in their hats or on their shoulders and ribbons that they have. This is March of 1913. The tricolors did not come out until December of 1913. So I'm going to assume that this is the suffrage yellow. This is Alice Paul's group though. And if you notice the tricolor banner in the background, uh, and so this is, uh, I'm not sure what year this was, but you notice their banners are tricolor, their sashes, you see how they're all white with lettering. It's various colleges and universities. And of course, these women are all in dark clothing. 
And we look at this and we think they're black. Honestly, you don't know because a dark blue, a dark red, a purple, all those colors in black and white film is going to come out, oh, they wore black. We don't know what color they had on. So this very typical look, by the way, this is Frank Wheeler Mondale, a representative from Wyoming with the suffragettes on the state capitol steps in 1914. This is a year after they came out with the tricolor. This is part of Alice Paul's and uh, Lucy Burns group. And you know they are part of the NWP because you see their sashes have absolutely no writing down through the center. And so this is part of the group. And this is picture right here is where we pick up that this is what the suffragette or the suffragist look like. And reality, it was more probably with as big a group as uh, the, uh, um, the large group had, it wouldn't have been this iconic look all the time. And then of course, you can also dress, there was a, a mom and a mini me. I think this one appears to be to me one of the union uh, banners that they have on. Now fashion and color played a crucial role, especially during public demonstrations, such as the pageants and the parades. It all depended upon the organizers. This is that iconic look. In December of 1915, they are all wearing white and it shows out against a sea of dark color. It looks organized, orderly, orderly balanced with harmony and style. Wearing this white and carrying Christmas garland is what they have uh, strung between them and then carrying the banners. But then this parade in 1917 is all the women in dark colors, but they're carrying place cards with the signatures of more than a million women. And it has an organized, orderly look to it also. So as an individual, you are free to wear the white dresser suit with the tricolor sash. But please keep in mind that the suffrage movement involved more than the white dress and the tricolored sash. Your everyday dress worn with a ribbon of color or carrying umbrellas also showed your support for the cause. And in closing, Mrs. Banks and I from Mary Poppins will be seeing you around this year as we celebrate 100 years of women voting while we sing Sister Suffragette. Thank you all, I appreciated being here. Oh, by the way, I'll put these two up. This is the one on the right. It's the one I have on today. Uh, and the one on the left is 1908. Because it's 1908, I actually wore the suffrage yellow ribbon, which I could very easily have put on with this white suit too. So at this point, we can open it up for questions. So I, I saw we did have a question in the chat box and it said, do you know what year Nevada women gained the right to vote? 1914. 1914? Yes. 1914. Had that okay. in part of here, I wanted to cover it. I actually spoke to Jan Lovren down at the National Archives where we have our women's, um, well, it's not just women, it's men, but she's over the, the textile. Uh, oh, the textile museum? Uh-huh. And I spoke with Jan and I spoke to, I'm blocking on her name, up at uh, the Historical Society up on North Virginia. I asked them, do we have any of this memorabilia around? We have plenty of stories, we have pictures of women, but we don't have the memorabilia. And I know, I know there has to be some around and somebody's attic uh, packed away somewhere. So, that supports what happened here in Nevada, because I was going to include pictures of those, um, but I didn't have time to cover all of that on our local level. There are many women here in Nevada that fought for women's suffrage. And remember when I said in that 10 years from like 1890 and 1867 up to 1900, the leaders were going out and talking to all the groups? We actually had some of them come here to Nevada and talk to us also. So um, 
I just, that's another whole talk in itself. But yeah. we did become a, a suffrage state in 1914. We certainly could. <laughs> well, it doesn't look like we have any other questions. Does anybody else have any other questions? You want me to hold yeah. up some of these ribbons and stuff that I have here? Yes, I would love to see the ribbons that you have. If you want to um, stop this sharing your screen. I unshare this, that would yeah, be. Yeah, unshare this so that we can see those up close. There we okay. go. So this is a ribbon I made. You can actually buy these. It's votes for ribbons. This is uh, one that I made as a delegate from Nevada in 1914. To go oh, cool. to, if I went back east, you can buy these. This is a tricolor one that is made by a lady on the internet. Remember, you could wear a white colored sash. And here's one here that says votes for women. Um, the suffrage yellow, it ranges from this yellow to this yellow. So anything that you think a sunflower might be, that would be okay to use. Here is a pennant. And as you know, this has nothing in it. I could wear this across my chest or I could write votes for women down through the uh, center of it. Okay. These are just a couple. England did a lot of putting their leaders into pins and wearing them. We in the US did not have that kind of fashion branding such as the WSPU have. And a lot of times you'll see women wearing the white, purple, and green sashes. That's England. But most people don't realize that. In fact, I was talking to a friend the other day. We were talking about this uh, PowerPoint I was doing. She said, I think it's just awful how all the women were treated the way they were treated. They were imprisoned and starved, and they force fed them. And they were, uh, and I'm like, OK, Nancy, uh, you do realize that uh, that was mostly in England and not so much here in the US. Our biggest group had over 2 million members and they were not into that kind of public civil disobedience. The NWP was, and a few of them were in prison. A few of them were force fed, but it was not to the extent of uh, England. This one is a votes for women, but the colors on it is British. And a lot of times people wear these things and wear them and think they're wearing something from America. It's okay to wear that. It's sort of like Picasso. Learn the rules and what goes with it and then feel free to break it. I support Britain, so I'm going to wear this, but this is a British pin. This is an American pin. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, that makes very much sense. Any other questions or comments? Nope, I think we're we are done. Thank you so much, Carolyn, for joining us tonight. You're welcome. And giving that really informative talk. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Thanks, Pam. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.